HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. With more than 30 weekly podcasts, HRN has something for every food lover. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We've been making cheese in Wisconsin since before we were even a state, which may be one reason why we win so many awards for it. It's what happens when a whole state dreams in cheese. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Well, hello. Welcome to All in the Industry on Heritage Radio Network. I'm your host and producer, Sherry Bayer, and it is February 22nd, 2024. And this is our 381st episode of this series, which is dedicated to behind the scenes talent in the hospitality industry. Today, I'm on location in my hometown of Miami with an acclaimed chef and restaurateur, and I will introduce her fully in a moment. First, as I do in every show, I will start out with my PR tip, then later we'll have my speed round game, industry news discussion, Solo dining experience, the final question. As the founder of Bayer Public Relations, I'm going to tip the show off with my PR tip of the week. So today's tip is to be able to work individually and together with others. Yes, there's a time and place for getting things done solo and showcasing your own personal voice and ideas without the influence of anyone else. And there can also be situations that call for collaboration and being a part of a team or a greater good. One is not better than the other, just different. And each are good skills to have. It may not be easy for everyone to master both, but we can all strive to understand when to act solo or as a unit and do our best to make both scenarios as amazing as they can be. That's my tip today. Okay, so I'm excited, as I said, to be in Miami with my guest today, who is Valerie Chang Kumpa, otherwise known as Val, <laughs> an award-winning Miami-based chef who, along with her family, opened Itame in the Miami Design District, focusing on Nikkei cuisine. And in 2019, the team opened a fast casual offshoot concept called B-Side inside the popular Asian food hall 1-800-LUCKY. Her latest restaurant opening is Maddie's in Miami's Midtown neighborhood, which has a modern take on Camita Criola, a traditional Peruvian food of Valerie's upbringing. Valerie, or Val, quickly garnered praise as one of the city's top young chefs, earning an Eater Young Gun nomination in 2018, two James Beard semifinalist nominations for Rising Star Chef in 2019 and 20, and nominations for Best Chef South in 2022 and 2023. And the accolades have continued, including Itame on the New York Times coveted restaurant list in 2021, and as Michelin Bib Gourmand in 2022, Maddie's on Bon Appetit's 24 Best New Restaurants in 
2023 and the New York Times restaurant list. And Val and her brother Nando were the first siblings to be named together to Food and Wine Magazine's Best New Chefs class of 2023. And Val was nominated this year for the 2024 James Beard Awards as a semifinalist for Maddie's as, a, as the Best Chef South category. There's more, but let's get to the show. It's amazing. Hi, hi, Val. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Well, I'm Very welcoming you. To be here. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> um, well, first, w- do you prefer Val or Valerie? Whichever. Whichever. Like, and then we'll. I've been called Val since I moved to the U.S. when I was in fifth grade. Nobody ever called me Valerie again. <laughs> oh, funny. So I usually even introduce myself as Val. Sometimes I catch myself and like, actually, my name is Valerie. Okay. Well, yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I think I, since I've met you, I've been calling you Val, but then when, you know, you're doing a formal introduction of someone, it's Valerie. Yeah. <laughs> no, we can, we can stay with Val since that's how we met. <laughs> okay. Very cool. So, so take us back a bit to your childhood. You grew up in Peru. Yeah. I grew up in Chiclayo, Peru, which is a Northern uh, coastal town by the, in, um, and I grew up with my brother and I grew up with our grandparents. Uh, and we were there till 2000, really early 2002. And then we came to meet up our parents here who had already been here working. Okay. Um, but we grew up alongside with my grandmother and my other cousins. Um, in our home, it was always super, food was always super important. My grandfather was uh, a passionate about food and and going to he had a different place to go eat for different uh menu items so we grew up with food being really important in our home and my grandmother was a great 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 cook my both of my grandmothers are great cooks yeah um, so grew up really influenced with food so when did you get the inkling that you wanted to pursue a career as a chef or it was early on in your childhood that you were you know influenced by food but do you think you'd make no, a career No, I didn't really choose till I was probably 18. 18, yeah. that's when I figured out that's what I wanted to do because I grew up in restaurants, right? Like when you move into the U.S., you know, it's a very true immigrant story. We lived in a one-bedroom apartment. All You know, my dad, my brother, and I, um, and my dad couldn't afford a babysitter, so he would take me to the restaurant when I, my parents were divorced, so I would spend time with my mom, I would spend time with my dad, and... um when I was with my dad and if he couldn't, he could never get a babysitter. But if my brother was out or if my, my cousins weren't around, I'd always, I'd always have to go to the restaurant with him and I would just garnish rolls, fry things, mozzarella sticks. And I, so I got comfortable with the kitchen and I got comfortable with the floor really fast. And I think at like 14 and a half, Around there, I had gone with my dad to work and one of the servers called out. And, you know, that's the beauty of being that young and careless. I said, well, I I can do this. Mm -hmm. I've been watching her do it for years. Can't be that hard. So my manager, crazy, let me, let me take, he let me take tables that night. And I crushed it and I made... (laughs) I mean, <laughs> I don't know if I crushed it, but you know, I <laughs> yeah, crushed, you crushed at it that, for yeah, that yeah, age. Yeah. I crushed it, and I made like three hundred dollars. Yeah, so you're like, so I, like I was this. like, I love this, <laughs> and I wanted to go. I was, I graduated high school at seventeen, so everybody was getting in my school. Everybody, not everybody, but if you wanted to, there was Europe trips, and you could take them the year, uh, your summer of junior year. And you come back as a senior or whatever. So I really wanted to go. And my dad said, obviously, I can't afford that, but I will meet you there. So then I said, well, this is perfect. I'm just going to earn my money here. And then I'll be able to go to Europe and my dad will help me. And he he bought the tickets for me to go. Yeah. And to stay. Then he said, well, you'll have to pay everything that you spend while you're there. You know, so you have to save for whatever you think you're going to spend there. So... I worked that summer and my dad, I think back and I was still in school and he would let me work. This was a kosher restaurant. So he would let me work Saturday nights and double Sundays. And after the double Sunday, we would drive an hour up north to drop me off at my mom's house so I could go to school Monday. And I did that that whole summer so I could, right before the summer actually, so I could. 
make it's my cool. money and go to go to um Europe. And then I, you know, once I did that job, I didn't I wanted to do I wanted to keep working. So my senior year, my friends, there was a Panera right by our neighborhood. So my friends were all working at Panera and then I went to Panera and I did the line and I did cashier. And then on the weekends, I would go be with my dad. And then when I graduated and I started going to college, I didn't, I wanted to do something in fashion. I, I really liked organizing. I really liked seeing colors. I really liked clothes and shoes. I really liked, shoes so <laughs> I, I really like shoes too <laughs> yeah I really I really liked a lot of those things so I wanted to do that so I started um visual uh being a visual merchandiser you know because for me my the way my brain works it's always been super easy to like receive a hundred boxes or something and have a plan of how they should be laid out where they would go so I started working in that but I was also going to school not you know not much direction I was too young when I started my dad was too busy working my brother was doing his thing too at the time so when I when I decided to go like Miami they was opening their first culinary school and they told us so I was like so my friend and I talked each other into we should go to the school and we tried to switch our majors but this time we had gone to college for two years and my dad said absolutely not I paid for this two years. I'm not, I'm not doing, I can't afford it, Val. And I did what every Latina young girl does. And I called my grandmother <laughs> and I said, Hey, Mati. I said, who's the name, who the name is, the restaurant yeah. named after. Yeah. And I wasn't sure if I was saying it right. I was saying Maddie's, but it's more. Well, now it's turning to Ma- Maddie's, but for me, it's Maddie's. Okay. Yeah. Um, I called her and I said, listen, I really want to go to culinary school. I think this is what I want to do. Um, but I need a lot of money. And it was like 7000 to get in because uniforms, knives, all these things. Yeah, and she books. said, I will help you. And she sent me the money. I still owe her till this day. <laughs> well, you named a restaurant after and her. She must she feel good said, about that. <laughs> I will send you the money. You just Her dream was she was one of eight. And the eldest. So she never got to go to school. And she was brilliant. Um, so she always wanted all of her grandkids to go to college, right? So she did her last big push. Um, I dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I dropped out of, of culinary school. Um, couldn't afford it. I was still too young. Couldn't get my, my head straight. And, and I said to myself, you know what? I want to make money. So I would just work. And I'll figure this out. So I went to apply a job as a hostess. I would always, my brother and I always took caterings for my dad. Yeah. So my dad would say, hey, I, I have two caterings. You go to this one, you go to this one. He would do the big work. And then we would come in to do like the smaller work. You know, at that point, Nando had already been making sushi for a while. So he did a lot of the big work. But I was always sent in for the, the smaller jobs. And um, what's your age difference between you? Three and years. He's older? Yeah. Okay. So when, yeah, when I finally decided, I went back, I started working in kitchens. I started, um, I really wanted to learn sushi because at the time there was not a lot of women who, who were behind sushi bars. There really isn't still. There still isn't. Um, um, yeah. It's interesting. But my dad didn't like, you know, my dad was too busy working 16 hour days. He was just like, I don't, he didn't really want this Fernando and I, you know, he wanted a different life for us. And he did it out of necessity. This isn't. This wasn't what he went to. My dad went to college. He, this wasn't what he grew up doing. You know, he just did it when he moved to the U.S. The only places that are willing to hire immigrants are restaurants, really, or construction. You know. Yeah. So that my dad came into this. Um, so he didn't really want this for us. We both really we wanted it anyway. And then I just started working, and then I did front of the house for for a lot of years. Oh well, that's. Great yeah. experience to have. And yep. then I did, and then I finally switched to back of the house. Probably at, probably at 20, I switched back of the house. And I was like, all right, this is, this is what I'm going to do. And yeah. Here I've been. So how did the idea for Itame come about? Am I saying that one right? Itamai. Itamai. Yeah. <laughs> My apologies. You're not the only one. I, um, I, I say this on the show because it's true. I, I 
look at words and I tend to pronounce them my own way. That's not necessarily the right way, but um, it am I. It am I. It am I. Yeah. Because I was looking back at my my Instagram because <laughs> being from Miami and I found my post from November 2019 wow. and I wrote, wish you could taste this La Punta and I, I know exactly what you're salmon about. ceviche at it's a Mai. Yeah. At the St. Roche Market, Miami, yeah. which what it was called, I think it was called Mia Miami. But I remember I went into the market and I knew about the market had opened and I was like exploring, but I didn't have a place I was definitely going to eat when I was there. And I saw your place and I went and I, I remember it was a special for the day because I asked for a recommendation and it was so delicious. It was so delicious. And this is 2019 before you became as, as, as popular <laughs> as, you know, as where your name was out there as much because it was more, you were part of this market. Yeah. So how did that come about? So the market was when my dad was looking to do a small little sushi bar. Nando was still doing music and I was working for Mike Solomonoff. Oh, nice. And in, they, in Philly? No, here. Remember, he opened a Disney Golf and a Federal Donuts. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I, well, yeah, he, he also came to New York for a little bit with, um, I did Disney Golf. Yes. Yeah. In the Chelsea market. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, oh, I, yeah. I, in my training, I he's spent amazing. two days there. He is amazing. He's in my book. He's in my Shepherd's book. He's, I love him. Um, a great mentor and somebody I've always been able to reach out to. And somebody that I really just genuinely care about because um, he's that creative person. Yeah, agree. Um, so, and oh, wow. they called they called a friend and I to do a healthy concept at the market. We explored it, and but we just weren't ready yet. And I said, "Hey, are you looking for a sushi vendor or anything?" And they said, "Yeah, we are." And I said, "Well, why don't you meet my dad?" So I introduced them to my dad, and then my dad made them sushi, and then they said yes, and then they opened very quickly. I was in North Carolina with Mike for food and wine, and my brother had to help my dad. And then when I, in, in North Carolina, Mike tells me, hey, listen, I'm going to close the stores, um, but you, we would like you to move to Philly, and we're going to have, and, you know, we'll keep going. And I, in that moment knew very clearly what I was going to do and I, you know, which was very hard for me to leave Mike's side because I thought we could go. I was young, very young when I started working with him, but I, I knew there was so much more potential in the relationship of, of chef and mentor, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> so then I said, thank you, but I'm going to, I think I'm going to go be with my dad. And Nando was already working with, helping my dad out. And then the rest is history. Wow, I I love learning stuff. I did not know that Mike was your mentor, and that's really cool. I mean, what what a great mentor to have and experience. Yeah, I mean, and the year I worked with him, I mean, it's it's kind of crazy because I wish I could work like I could work with him now, so you could see like how much better I am. Because at that moment, I was also limited to what I knew, you know. So it was we had our he had challenges with me of things that like I just was too young to know which I'm sure he I I feel he got and I'm sure I don't know has he been here to any of your restaurants yes, yes okay yes. okay I will like have a little bit of a heart attack if Mike comes into town and <laughs> oh no we just kidding pretty much we always make sure we reach out to each other at least once yeah here, yeah know? no I I'm a big fan and uh yeah good good person Good, amazing chef. I mean, yeah, it's nice having him in his restaurants in Brooklyn now. Yeah. So, um, okay, cool. So you opened in the market and then talk a little about the transitions that you went through. Well, was it, was it like an instant success? And then you decided to move into the more full service restaurant space that was downstairs in the plaza? It wasn't an instant success. It was, uh, we, we waited just like anybody else, you know, for people to 
St. Rock Market was an instant success. Like people really wanted to come because it was the only first market of its kind. Yeah. You know, you had 100 Lucky, but 100 Lucky was is only Asian food. So, um, and different vibe. I don't know. Total different yeah. vibe. So, but you know, we, we had to put in the work like everybody else, you know, we just count, we would, our goals would be like a thousand dollars a day, you know, like, can we just get to a thousand today? Can we get, cause it was for us starting from zero. Mm-hmm. So with those, we had little goals and then we, you know, started noticing we had something special and then we kept working at it, kept working at it, kept working at it. And then the space became available downstairs and we took it and then COVID happened. <laughs> yeah. I remember, well, actually I was looking back at all my posts. Oh, I went to your pop-up you did with, it wasn't a pop-up, but your collaboration with Lama Inn. Oh yes. That's where we met. And that was, yeah, that was, was in 2021. I was at the bar. Yeah. I did that. And then in 2022, I remember being in the courtyard and right. I wrote about your tuna Terra Dito and, and sitting outside because it was, but yeah, no, that's, yeah, that, um, that was a cool collaboration you did. I love those guys. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of respect for them and what they do and how they view Peruvian food. And I very much connect with them. Um, they inspire me. They inspire me so yeah. much. Yeah. He's a great chat, Eric. So, um, talk about your cuisine though, because you've mentioned sushi, but you're doing Peruvian cuisine. Yeah. So now look, it honestly takes, you, you open a restaurant, you have an idea. Mm -hmm. This is me with my experience now, right? You open a restaurant, you have an idea and then the restaurant will tell you what it's going to be. Yeah. I've heard this, but it's not, it's not like it doesn't. So I originally wanted to play with just very traditional soul food Peruvian cooking um and the portions were massive and we couldn't figure it out and then um it took us a while to come to be who who we are now which is we're a Peruvian restaurant of the, through the eyes of of you know Nando and I who have left Peru mm-hmm. 22 years ago okay and who are inspired by other ingredients, who are inspired by other cultures that we're exposed to here. So we are a Korean restaurant, but we we are Korean chefs, but but we but we look at it differently because we've been gone from Peru for 22 years. We go, we go a lot. We go like three four, three times a year. Yeah, but you know we're exposed to different ingredients, different techniques we see what our peers are doing we were exposed to so so different so for me I've learned to just be really content in that place of understanding that my roots every sauce every dish we make the soul of it is Peruvian all the ingredients and the technique or how we may look at this all comes from inspiration from everywhere else I love that I took a solo trip to Peru in 2016 I went to Lima I went to Cusco they did Machu Picchu. And that trip was so amazing. And I, I went to went to Central and I also went to Mido. And Mido, I mean, they all blew me away. But I was like, I've since gotten to know Misha from, from there. He just, you know, Latin America's the uh, 50 yeah. best. He's just number one spot. And Central is like number one and on the world's 50 best. And they're, they're also Latin America. I mean, these restaurants have really made a mark. And I think people are starting to become more familiar with that type of cuisine. But um, I guess may, maybe I'll tie this into my question from my last guest where I'm going with this. So um, on episode 380, I had on Andrew Zimmern. He's an Emmy winning and four time James Beard award winning TV personality, chef, writer and social justice advocate. And his question for you is describe the twin challenges of coming up in this business as a woman and a chef and a restaurant owner and the hurdles and the work that you had to do to establish yourself at the same time, cooking in a style that is not as familiar to most Americans. So I think with like Japanese or Peruvian cuisine, Peruvian cuisine, like maybe it's becoming a little more mainstay now, but what's your experience with it? I think being a female chef, the biggest hurdle I, I encounter is how people will treat me and how they will just automatically treat Nando. Yeah. It's very fast 
Um, and now I've called it out so many times to him that he, he, the other day was like, I know it's because you're a woman that this is happening. <laughs> like he called it out himself, you know? Yeah. So that's my biggest challenge. But I've, I've been blessed to be raised really closely to Nando. So I've always had a layer of protection. <laughs> that's that maybe good or may not be good. Cause sometimes it's made me a little bit too free and, and then too, um, it has allowed me not to look at some things a little more careful because I've just always known I've had my big brother next there to, next to me to protect right, me. Right. But I don't know, you know, I have a very strong personality and I, um, I have my challenges, of course, but I think now I reach more challenges as just, you know, as an operator where like I have to, you know, make sure I make all my moves as careful as possible. Um, I do a lot of work for that. I do a lot of therapy. I do a lot of work to grow as a, as a, as a boss, as a chef, as a person to make sure that no matter where I'm going, I'm, I don't lose sight of things. I'm not going to because that's not my personality, but sometimes I feel really like a lot of pressure or very anxious. And, and sometimes I've allowed that to get the best of me on a day um, where when I was able to really look at myself in that and I started therapy almost four years ago, the therapy I mainly do is to make sure I'm always able to show up for everybody the best way possible, you know? healing a lot of the other stuff but mainly it's like okay process things digest them and there's not that serious this isn't really anxiety this is you're just nervous or maybe you're uncomfortable you know like yesterday it's food and wine weekend and um one of the things about you know getting all these accolades you these are accolades I've never dreamt about you know yeah it, it, there's just that's not me I've never sat anywhere and been like I can't wait till I have this and this and this I'm usually pretty pretty uh i'm driven by the team i have around me you know and, and yeah. i i'm protective of my feelings so i tend not to like want to think too, too much because of the disappointment or anything you know so but the thing about having these many accolades you have a lot of eyes on you yeah well some I eyes mean, are excited yeah to see what you do and some eyes are just waiting to see if you're that good or not you know yeah. the hype is real yeah and you can tell because some people come here with the energy like let's see what the hype is all about right um <laughs> and last night you know it's food and wine weekend and i we did a deep clean i mean we were scrubbing like we came in super early as a team i was scrubbing bathrooms you know uh, my mom is a super cleaner she always kept our house really <laughs> clean and Nano and I are the same way. Yeah. So like whenever she cleaning for the bathroom, I'm always like, it's me, it's me. I have to do it because I know all the little spots, you know. Um, and I was telling the team, you know, I, I believe we're going to have a lot of people coming in this weekend. We're going to be very excited to try us. And our job is just to deliver, you know. Um, there's a moment where we had maybe like five tables of, of chefs that I really admire. And they all knew each other. They're all from New York. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they're all giving each other hugs and kisses and talking to kisses each other last night yeah yeah and at some point they weren't sitting down to eat because they were they were so, they were so happy to see each other right right and then and they all sat random, down together and they all sat down at one time and then I was just like oh lord I'm gonna <laughs> feed all these chefs that I really um, look up to at one time plus the whole dining room is full at this point you know mm -hmm. and I for a second I started getting like really anxious and I remember you know something that I really work with in therapy which is just like enjoy the moment like instead of being anxious or nervous about like oh my god I can't believe this happening like what if it goes bad like why don't you just take this moment and be like I cannot believe I'm gonna cook for these people yeah and they're and here and they're mm -hmm. here so take this moment in and perform you know that's awesome. awesome. So I had the moment yesterday and I was like, oh, I got to go to you. What am I going to do? I'm going to pass out. And then, then we went, you know, we hung out a little bit, some people last night um, after service. And, and I realized like, they were like, we were just so happy, like the energy. And it was all because like, we felt good. And they were also just, we, we created a space for them to feel comfortable enough, like their home. So they were all giving each other hugs and getting up from their tables and talking to the next table and talking to the other table. And I am just really happy that we were able to do that. 
Yeah. I'm that. like, I'm sorry I wasn't here. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> no, it's really nice. And I think um, your way, your your mindset, and um, I, I think that's wonderful because they're coming here for a reason. And I don't think the chefs coming here are the ones coming to be like, oh, let me see. If, no, not you know, them. Not them. I think a lot of other people, but, you know, but we, we hear it. We hear it. You know, yeah. We get the reviews and they're like, yeah. Meh, yay, nay. Yeah. But they're coming, I think, yeah, they're coming here more because as a, like, a colleague of someone in the industry, they want to have your food and respect and all that. And they also just want a delicious meal, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I know these are all people that I've met through, through yeah, the years. Yeah. You know, I, I always make it a point to, I've done as many events as my body has allowed me to. Yeah. <laughs> I still currently sign up for any, like, not any, but most of the events that I, that I am interested in the cause. So I think it's you know um, a mar- like a marriage that coming together all the chefs whoever's participating will make a greater cost for the community yeah i will still stretch myself to make it um so it was nice you know I, sometimes when i have moments like that i'm able to look around and be like oh my god these are, i mean these are all people i've met yeah i mean they bring other people these are all people i have met and i'm like wow it's I am so freaking blessed that they would pick like they have a million restaurants they could go to and they decide to come like pay the respects yeah no it's and awesome love, you congratulations know, that, you have those are the moments where i'm like pinch yourself relax this isn't anxiety you're just nervous because yeah. it's out of your control you know it's, it's let them have a good time and do what you do and take for whatever it is take it all in you know yeah and i'm coming on saturday because you're doing a collab yes with i was calling her isabel but i realized Chabela is kind of her nickname. Yeah, her Isabel is called Chabelas. And I recently was in D.C. and I went to Lou Tess, her restaurant there, and met her, which was so cool. And I've I've met Anna Castro from Lengua Madre uh-huh. in New Orleans. I met her at the Beard Awards and I was on the red Last carpet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm really excited. So Saturday night you're doing collaboration with them. What, what can I expect or how are you guys working together on this? So... We all have two dishes on the menu. Um, I switched my dishes quickly once I realized <laughs> that, like, obviously they were going to be making very Mexican forward. And I, you know, we have the whole fish, which is a very popular dish here. So we do an ají amarillo bar blanc, but to pay honor to them, I've decided to do a poblano with serrano bar blanc. Um, and every the three dishes I have is just to pay honor to them because I am always in in such complete awe and I have so much admiration and respect for them you know um when when I spoke to Lee about cooking this year Mm -hmm. I was like I know exactly who I want to cook with and these are the two girls that I think the world needs to see I mean the world sees them already but yeah Miami needs to see them you know they are incredible they're so talented um I suspect that we'll have a great time there'll be a lot of mezcal and we'll <laughs> hopefully <laughs> I'm like now I have to make sure that we order enough um I expect us to have mezcal I expect us to um you know we're very fun like when Chavela and I went to receive our food and wine Oh, right. She got that honor too yes it's amazing. Anna did too the year before oh my god amazing there you go um such a that's like we bonded it's a really like, special honor to get the yeah best new it chef was very yeah. special and it was more special be, by the people you share it with um and yeah, Chavel and nice. I and Anna we like to have a great time <laughs> well it's gonna be <laughs> a great besides, time besides oh. us cooking we really like to have a great time so we yeah. plan to turn off the music at the end of the night and have fun and dance and and I know that there's a couple after parties, but I'm going to, um, you know, I know some my friends are going to be around and I'm going to let everybody know whoever wants. They can come to Matisse and we'll just see where the night takes us. <laughs> well, it's, I'm, I'm so excited to be coming. And yeah, and I haven't had Anna's food yet. And but Tabella's desserts. Oh, my God. They were like blew me away. I was there maybe like about a month ago. So. Um, well, I'm looking forward to that. Before we take a break, just 
one more thing about like your cuisines or the different, the different restaurants you have now, because you have three different concepts. And at my tip, I took a little from, from what I understood and correct me if I'm wrong, but are, is this Maddie's like you're running ship, like it's your place or is Nando also like, are you collaborating on it? Yes. And then, okay. A hundred percent. I cannot do this on my own. This is quite large. Okay. Um, and, and we, and I think, I thrive better when I'm with my brother around, you know, I mean, it's taking us a while to, you know, because you're still in your creative space, right? So it's taking us time to get to a place where each of us are, you know, understand that process. But yesterday, for instance, I felt that I was like, oh, where's my brother? You know, he's prepping for his event. But I really felt it like I was like, there's so many people here that are so important. Where's my brother? But not because because I just feel like I know things are going to be like nothing will slip the two of us, you know, or together. You know, and usually we're on opposite sides of the past, you know, double checking, double checking things. So what a special relationship. I mean, like looking, you know, talking to you and watching you as you talk about him, it's just you obviously have a really strong bond. And to be able to work together in the restaurant industry, which can be tough and challenging, as you said, stressful and like all this stuff happening, but you guys like you're there to support each other and um, obviously have a good, I don't want to say teamwork, but like a good balance or like you you can read each other and help each other out and support each other. And so, yeah, it's I really think we're amazing. both pretty good anchor of each other you know so yeah. we tend to always remind each other what we're actually doing this for you know not what everybody thinks we're doing it for yeah <laughs> you know and so we're able to help each other out and, and be there for each other really wow it's very special and I feel very lucky to know you guys and like to be here with you today and just get to know you better. It's amazing. So we're going to take a little break. We'll come back. We'll play my speed round. We'll talk a little industry news, my solo dining experience and the final question. So stay with us. This is All in the Industry on Heritage Radio Network. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. There's a reason when you think of Wisconsin, you think cheese. Cheese is a huge part of Wisconsin's history and future. In Wisconsin, the state of cheese, the tradition of cheesemaking excellence began 180 years ago, before Wisconsin was recognized as a state. Immigrants traveled to settle in this lush, green hills of Wisconsin, bringing their cheesemaking traditions with them. These storied skills combined with the freshest milk available created a cheesemaking culture that is uniquely Wisconsin. Wisconsin's 1,200 cheesemakers, many of whom are third and fourth generation, continue to pass on old world traditions while adopting modern innovations in cheesemaking craftsmanship. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Welcome back to All in the Industry on Heritage Radio Network. I'm your host and producer, Sherry Bayer. And today my guest is Valerie Chang Kumpa, or Val. And she is an award-winning Miami-based chef with restaurants Itame, Beside, and Maddie's. And we are here at Maddie's, um, which is so lovely looking out the windows here in Midtown, which is a neighborhood of Miami that didn't even exist when I grew up here. <laughs> but it's like thriving, thriving. Gorgeous, gorgeous day, gorgeous restaurant. Okay, so it's time for my speed round. All right. What this is, is I'm going to name a couple things and you get to pick your preference, such as chocolate or vanilla. Okay. Okay, here we go. Eat in at home or eat out at a restaurant. (laughs) Well, you're looking at me. (laughs) Eat in. A lot of chefs, I have to say, a lot of people I talk to, interviews, Say eat in. I don't know if it's um, because you're at the restaurant all the time, but um, yeah. I think it's a lot, a lot of eat in. Yeah. So it's not so chaotic. Yeah. Okay. Indoor dining or al fresco dining? Indoor, all the way. Ooh. Wine, beer, cocktail, mocktail, or champagne? I'm going through a wine phase right now. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I will not be going through that wine phase tomorrow. And maybe the, I was saying mezcal phase is the next phase going going through. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
<clears throat> That'll be tomorrow's face. How about tasting menu or a la carte? A la carte. All the way. Small plates or large plates? Small plates. Camino table or chef's counter? Chef's <laughs> counter. Taking that one very seriously. Tipping or all-inclusive charge? All-inclusive. Open kitchen or closed kitchen? Open kitchen. Cooking for your brother or dad or having them cook for you? Having them cook for me. 100%. <laughs> There's no love, hesitation on that one. I love when I go to... My brother actually cooks lunch home with his fiance Lauren. And I love when they text me and they're like, hey... We make dinner. Do you want some? Or the other night, I was, he just moved into the building. Oh, okay. Matis is. Okay. Because he's getting ready to open it to my AO next door. Oh. So um, I I'm, I'm going to move in about a month upstairs as well. Okay. So we need to be a little bit closer yeah, to work. Yeah. And now uh, we have dogs, sashimi, meadow, and chapo. <laughs> and we need to be a little closer to them. So the other night, I was leaving work and I was very tired and I found a little pasta a takeout container with a salad he had made. And it was still like nice and warm. And I was very excited to just eat that when I got home. So I love when my brother cooks. I love that. And invites me. We, we need to take a little, we have two more in this, but talk a little about what's happening with Itamai. Itamai A-O. A-O. A-O means blue in Japanese. Oh. Since so Itamai only, you know, focuses on the ocean. Um, you'll see our, you know, iconic uh, terrazzo that was pink before. Now it'll be blue. It's a different one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's very beautiful. Um, and it's opening, you should show me the space. Soon. And it's very beautiful. Soon. It's very soon. We're okay. just waiting for some equipment to come in. Okay, soon. Soon. Maybe, maybe oh. by the time this show airs. We'll see. Well, I don't know. That's next week. But <laughs> <laughs> soon. Know. Soon. Okay. All right, the last two from the game. I have cheese plate or dessert. Dessert. And Manhattan, Brooklyn, or Miami. Or I guess, what's it? Wait, I can't pronounce the city you're from in Peru. Again. Chigayo? Yeah. I looked on the map where it was. I saw it was up in the north, like yeah. you said. Um, so between those four. Miami. <laughs> All right. Love it. Until Miami. I one day move to New York and then I'll be in New York. <laughs> okay, well. I, I welcome you. <laughs> I love coming down here, though, visiting. And um, Okay, so that's the game. That was fun. So for industry news, picked out something like you're in the piece a little bit. So on Eater Miami, the article's entitled, Michelin adds eight new Miami restaurants to its guide ahead of its larger awards ceremony in April. And this was by Ali Fowler. And this came out on the 15th of February. So Mich- it's about Michelin Guide has once again expanded its culinary footprint in Florida, unveiling 19 new restaurant additions to its coveted list in Miami, Orlando, and Tampa. Miami leads the way this year with eight new entries, while Tampa received six and five in Orlando area. And among one in Miami is Peruvian inspired Maddie's. Yay! <laughs> um, so that's cool. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I think, I mean, Michelin, I was up a few months ago. They did the Michelin Awards um, in New York, and it was New York, D.C., and Chicago. They combined it all. Um, and it was it was really great. It's interesting the way they do their announcements, because they kind of put this out there that you're, like, in the book or you're included in the guide, but they're not saying exactly what, like, what that means for like, is that mean you have a Michelin star? Does that mean you're Bib Gourmand? That's the way I read it. I haven't looked okay. <laughs> so much into it. I believe that they're saying you're in the guide. Yeah. And that you're, you're in the guide no matter what. Yes. And then and they're going to, there's a possibility you're in the running for anything. Yeah. And then in the, it's April 18th in Tampa, they're doing the, oh, the ceremony. And at that, award ceremony, they will announce what specifically each award is. So, but you're in, 
So congratulations. And that's cool. I don't know. It's a big, I, I mean, I remember Michelin, Michelin came to Florida a couple of years ago and it was, you know, a big, big deal to have it here now. Yeah. So. You know, anything that helps Miami and the food scene and the food culture that we have here and let the world know that we're not so behind everyone like they think that we have yeah. things going on. We don't. We don't desire to be any other state or ha- or city. We're happy with our own and what we do and what we create here. No, we're also creating very special, yeah, places. I agree. I mean, now when I come down to Miami, I always have you know lists of places I want to check out and visit. I don't think maybe back. I'm going back like twenty years ago. You know, <laughs> like it was just get me my stone crabs. I didn't have as many restaurants on my list to yeah. check out. And now I'm like overwhelmed in the sense that I can't get to everywhere I want to go in the three days I'm going to be here. So, but um, yeah, it's cool. So we'll stay tuned to see what the announcements are, but um, it's Michelin Miami. And so for my solo dining experience this week, I'm going to give you the rundown. And this week it's at Gotham Burger Social Club. So here we go. The location. 131 Essex Street in Lower East Side of New York City. The concept, New York City's biggest pop-up now has a home seven days a week. And they have more of the burgers, too. So the owner is Mike Puma. Why did I go? Well, I'm friends with Mike. I'm a fan of Mike's, and I'm a fan of his burgers, his pop-ups he's been doing for years. And I actually interviewed him back in 2021 with the show I did on the South Beach Wine and Food Festival um, it was episode 290. Um, so he was just doing his burger pop up. So now he is a, a brick and mortar place. So that's why I went. Experience uh, recently went. It's cold in New York. It was a cold night. I walked over there. It was kind of early. It was a weekday. It wasn't super busy. Um, fortunately, Mike wasn't there. So I missed him. But I ordered at the counter, paid. They uh, waited for my name to be called and uh, sat in the back and, um, I had a good time. I mean, it was like a chill, a chill burger night out by myself. So what I get? Well, I got the Gotham Smash single burger with grilled onions, American cheese, house meat, pickles, jalapenos, club sauce, ketchup, and mustard. And then I got two sides because I wanted to try the frickles. And I got it with club sauce and ranch. And then I also got their tater tots. My take? Still an awesome burger. I don't know if you've ever had um, the Gotham burger social club smash burger, but it's a delicious one. And he did all these pop-ups. And so now it's great that he has this standalone place and the frickles were great, very tasty dipping sauces. Tots were great too. So the ambiance, so it's a casual corner spot. It's got big windows uh, on both sides and wood tables, booths. And um, in there's an open kitchen in the front with counter seats. So you order at the front and then you can sit in the back. There's a bunch of booths. Perfect for burger craving, solo or with friends. Interesting tidbit. Mike Puma started the Gotham Burger Social Club in 2013 as his way to bring his love of food and friends together. It was supposed to be a one-year burger tour with his close friends has now developed into a lifestyle of great food, beef, and spirits. Personal fun fact. So I've been going to his pop-ups over the years. He most recently had had one. He did pretty regularly at Ray's in the Lower East Side, and there's always a huge line, so sometimes it's it's good to know Mike. <laughs> but I've gotten there sort of at the end of the day, too, where it's like he's like down to like the last two burgers, and you kind of score one. You feel lucky. Um, so another interesting tidbit. Interestingly, I just wanted to mention another burger spot that j- recently opened in New York, and this is Hamburger America, and it's George Motz's place, and he's directed a documentary and film and written books detailing the history of the hamburger in the U.S. So he opened this spot. It's on the other side of town. It's West Soho, at McDougal Street in Houston, and it's it's also awesome. I went there solo, too, and I tried both of his burgers. He's a fried onion burger and a classic smash. And I got shoestring fries and chocolate egg cream. And this is a little more of a, like a diner feel. I was sitting at the counter there. There's seats in the back, but they do have counter seats and you're right there in the action. So anyways, shout out to him too. Another awesome burger spot. 
so the cost of my meal, actually, I was looking at the cost of both of my meals, and they were both around $23, not including tax gratuity. Would I go back? Yes to both. And websites, I'll give them both shouts out. I got website gbsc.nyc and at Instagram, Gotham Burger Social Club, and website Hamburger America Today and at Hamburger underscore America and at Mott's Burger. Okay, so there you go. Did I make you crave burgers is the question. Yes, I am thinking currently right now, <laughs> what am I eating for lunch? Um, yeah, me too. But what am I doing later today? I'm going to the Burger Bash. So I'm going to have all my burger Everyone fix. Everyone is today. Are you going to be there? You got to be here at the restaurant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going. It's, you know, it's... And here it's, it's like a family tradition. <laughs> it's it's like the, the I'd say, like the original of the, like these big walk-around tasting events. It's on the beach. So it's cool. You know, you, you're walking on I've sand. Never been. It's, I have to it's go. worth checking out some time. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, South Beach Wine and Food Festival, which is why I'm down here in Lee Schrager, started this festival. This is the, the 23rd year and it just keeps growing, getting bigger and more events and so many chefs from New York and elsewhere come down for it. And it's really the production team, just you know, right, Randy Fisher of Cream. It's love for Randy Fisher. He's amazing. I had him on a guest on my show a long time ago. And Devin Padgett, who also works on it, both friends who've been on the show. And they're just, yeah, Randy and his team, they're just they put this thing together and Devin, like the whole team is like, She's they make it look like it's easy to put together this giant festival. And it's not easy. It's not, but it's. Yeah. No, they're amazing. I mean, a lot of the reason I like coming down to this is like to see them and to just like be like, you guys are rock stars. So I'm going to have burgers later tonight. And before I let you go, I need to ask you for the final question. So. My next guest is Milu Motamed. She's an Emmy-nominated TV personality who has been named one of Adweek's 30 most influential people in food. She's been shaping the conversation in food and travel for more than 20 years. She was born in Iran, raised in Paris and New York, and at one point she served as the editor-in-chief at Food & Wine. And she's also been a longtime features director for Travel and Leisure magazine. So she's worn a lot of hats in the culinary space, but I'm going to be having her on and hearing all about her fascinating career. But Val, can you ask a question for Nilu? It could be anything. I guess I'm always curious when, when, like, how do, how do people who may not have a very traditional background in food or, or like working in kitchens or if they work in kitchens, where does this love begin? Yeah. Where, how do you pick this in your career? What moment do you say, this is what I want to do? This is what drives me. How does it drive you? Does it drive you because, you know, a grandmother or a mother or a father who, who, or what does food mean to you that led you to want to follow this or pursue this or take a risk on it and go behind a career? I love it. I'm going to find out. And I'm going to ask you to, and I don't know, I try to go and order my shows and I don't know when this one's going to air, but I'm going to be going on the Pan Con podcast. And I figure you must, or do you know, chef owner, partner, Michael Beltrain of Ariete? We call each other cousins. Okay. Well, I figured you must at least know him. And I would like kick myself if I didn't ask you, ask him a question too, because I'm going to be going on his show and then I'm going to use our recording also for my show. So I figure I can ask him things as well as he asked me. So he has, he's got Ariete, which is a one Michelin star restaurant. He's got Chug's Diner. He's got the Gibson Room, Grocery Laurel. He's looking on his website. He's got a lot of concepts now. So Val, as your cousin, <laughs> what would you like to ask him? <laughs> It's a little tricky because I usually just ask him directly all my questions. Be like, I like to ask him, wait, what is his vision for his hospitality group? Where does he want to go? Where does he want to take it? What does he want to be known for? I love what it. What is his legacy? I'm excited to chat with him. And when is he marrying Rachel? Oh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> We got that that question in there. Um, I'm going to ask him all of that. Um, 
<laughs> well, I've listened to his show, and it's, it's a very I'm free a very, flowing. Like, we have a very like sibling relationship. We get into. Yeah, wouldn't surprise him. I text him this every day. Awesome. I'm gonna find out. I have. I mean, one of the reasons or the reason I'm going on his show is I have a new book out called Chef Wise. Yes, and um, so we were talking about that. And I've been asking all chefs too, like, what's your top chef advice as a leading chef in the industry? Like, what do you have advice? For anyone else, if they're aspiring young cooks, someone who maybe wants to get into this crazy field? I mean, the technicalities are easy, right? Like, you want to cook, you got to learn to cook, you got to go and cook, right? I think now what I've learned most is how much you need to take care of yourself to be able to really show up as a leader in all ways. You know, how important it is to take really good care of yourself, you know, and not... You know, we're still working the long hours. We're still doing the grind. But the way I look at my my rest or taking care of my mind is completely different than I ever had. And it's led me to be in different places that I've never been before. I love it. I love that you're doing that. And it's great advice. And um, the rest is technical, right? Like, yeah. if you want to become a restaurant manager, start at the door. Then go into support then going to servers and spend some time being bar back. Then at the bar, you know, you round yourself out. Same as a cook, right? It's more like we don't talk enough about how much we need to take care of yourself. You need to exercise, but not exercise because you need to be skinny and fit. You exercise because it helps your, it helps you mentally, you know, to be in a stable place, Yeah. to, to release that energy, to feel more energy, um, how much therapy helps, you know, Yeah. talking to somebody, not about your problems. Sometimes you talk to somebody about how it feels when somebody doesn't get the time on time uh, to work on time. And you feel like they're not valuing your work or not taking it as serious. And then, you know, therapy teaches you that they're just also trying to do the best that they can. And that it's not that serious and that everything's going to be okay. And that the restaurant's not supposed to be perfect in month one. That everything is an ever ongoing solution, yeah. you know. Or uh, I'm sitting here thinking, looking at you with your smile and your <laughs> amazing advice, and I'm like, "Will you be my therapist?" <laughs> like you have no. such great advice. Listen, I, um, no, it's I really did a therapy session. Yeah. Before I did this. Well, you get, okay. Well, that's good. Uh, all, anyone I interview in the future, do therapy before our show because <laughs> you're going to come out sounding really great. <laughs> um, that's the show. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. It was wonderful speaking to you. You made me feel very comfortable. Ah, I'm glad. I Thank you. Ready. You make me feel very comfortable <laughs> and you feed me very well. I'm I'm truly a major fan of Thank everything you. you, your brother, father, like you all have done. And I love I I I, I love your your relationship with your family and that you've been so successful just like working hard and going after, you know, your vision. And I wish you much continued success. I don't know. I, you know, you know how many more accolades I could have read off at the beginning, but. That's um, okay. No more reading of those. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, but it's I, cool. No, it's, it's cool. cool. I didn't want to, you know, I mean, it's, it's a big deal, especially because I don't know, you didn't get into this to be like, because of I want to win this award, but you're like being recognized because you're doing the work and people are appreciating your food and your cuisine, and your hospitality and everything. So it's all good. Maybe I'll see you. Um, I'm planning to go to the Beard Awards. So maybe I'll see you there. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll see you on Saturday. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. My guest today has been Valerie Chang Kumpa. She's an award winning Miami based chef and restaurateur with three concepts here are Itame, B Side, and Maddie's. Websites are itamemiami.com, bsidemiami.com, and maddiesmiami.com. On Instagram, you can follow her. Am I going to say this right? Shifta Chang? Yep, Chifita Chang. I said that better than me. And uh, handles at itamemiami, at bside underscore Miami, and at Maddie's Miami. And South Beach, check out Sobe. WFF, that's S O B E W F F dot org. And on Instagram, uh, they're at S O B E W F F and same hashtag. 
And um, I'm excited to be here and going to all these events. You can follow me at Sherry Bayer at Bayer PR and at All Industry. My Facebook page is All in the Industry. My websites are BayerPublicRelations.com, SherryBayer.com, and All in the Industry.com. All of our shows are archived at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. We are also on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Check out my new book, Chef Wise Life Lessons from Leading Chefs Around the World by Fiden. It's available now wherever books are sold. Many thanks to my engineer today, Armin. Thanks again to Val. Thanks to our publicist, Lauren. Thanks to Katie and Lee Schrager and the entire South Beach Wine and Food Festival team for having me this amazing festival weekend. And um, that's it. I'm your host and producer, Sherry Bayer. I'll be back next week with a new show. Hope you'll tune in then. Thank you as always for being part of all in the industry. Bye. All in the Industry is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe. <laughs>